Welcome to the next video in the blueprint of life topic. This video is going to look at the dot point, explain how Darwin Wallace's theory of evolution by natural selection and isolation accounts for divergent evolution and convergent evolution. So let's look again specifically at Darwin's theory of natural selection. So this was one of several key concepts in the theory of evolution. So Darwin wasn't the only one to put forward a theory of evolution. Quite a number of people through history had put forward their ideas. However, Darwin's, as we looked at in a couple of the last lessons, was the one that was providing the most evidence to support his theory. So he put forward his theory in his book on the origin of species. And as we can remember from the preliminary course, this caused quite a um, outrage within the Catholic Church and the big debate, the Huxley Wilberforce debate between um, people of the church and people of science who thought that Darwin's ideas were completely ludicrous and that um, how could humans possibly have evolved from apes and chimpanzees. So after spending much time on the HMS Beagle, where he travelled around the world observing many species of plants and animals, including coming to Australia, where he had a look at a number of different plant and animal species, including the platypus, the magpie, eucalypt species, and then going to places like the Galapagos Islands and having a look at the finches on the different islands within the, the group of um, the, sorry, the, the finches on the different islands in that chain of islands, he came up with his theory of natural selection that organisms evolved over time based on their environment. So natural selection can also some to be, sometimes be referred as the survival of the fittest, which you may have heard. And as we go through the four steps that are required for natural selection to take place, it will probably make a little bit more sense why survival of the fittest is sometimes used. So in order for natural selection to take place, there needs to be these four things taking place. There must be variation within a population. So if every single individual within a population is exactly the same as the next, uh, natural selection can't take place because if there's a change in the environment, then bang, all of them will be wiped out at once. Okay, so but if we've got some changes within some individuals within the overall population, if a change occurs and those different individuals are able to survive, then we're in business. So there needs to be a degree of competition within the population, whether, it for, whether it's for food, space, uh, reproducing mate, and this variation favors some of the population to survive. So we refer to this as a selective advantage. So some organisms have an advantage over others and those ones that don't die and the individuals that do have this selective advantage survive they reproduce and pass on these traits to their offspring. So a really big thing that needs that's important with natural selection is the traits must be hereditary, hereditary. So they have to be able to be passed on from generation to generation. And eventually what will happen is a new population will have more individuals with the variation than not. The process will continue and eventually that uh, adaptation will become the norm. It won't just be a variation amongst a few in the population, it will become the variation amongst all. So here we can see an example that we've looked at really briefly with our giraffes. So here we've got two giraffes which show variation, one with a short neck and one with a long neck. There's competition within the species here for food, so obviously giraffes all eat the same type of food. And the better adapted members of the species are more likely to survive because they're fitter. So fitter simply means being able to reach reproductive age and pass their traits on. And then as we can see in the fourth picture, these survivors will pass on their better genes to their offspring and their offspring will be born with longer necks. And eventually all these shorter neck giraffes will die off and they will no longer be part of the population. So here's a couple of more examples, two of which we've already looked at being the peppered moth. So we can see here that the peppered moth used to be this light colour here, which was really suited to the environment of the time. So the lighter coloured moths blended in with the trees, so they weren't being eaten by the birds. Every now and then one of these dark moths would pop up in the population, and obviously at the time they weren't very, that variation wasn't very favourable. So these moths would have been getting eaten more than these. 
However, with the introduction of the Industrial Revolution, the trees started to turn this darker colour and now all of a sudden these darker moths were surviving while well, these lighter moths were dying off because they were a lot more obvious now so they were being eaten more. So these guys here were able to survive, pass on that dark colour gene to their offspring and then as we saw in the first video, we ended up with a population that was about 98% of these dark moths in comparison to only about 2% of the light, whereas it was quite the opposite before the Industrial Revolution. Another example here is resistance to antibiotics of bacteria. So we can see in our original population of bacteria, there's a whole range of resistance levels. So some of these lighter pink ones had a very low resistance to antibiotics and the darker color ones had a high resistance to antibiotics. We can see that those with the high resistance survived and we know the bacteria reproduces very quickly. So what ends up happening is these uh, highly resistant bacteria reproduce and we end up with a population that's almost totally made up of these bacteria that are possessive of this really high resistance level. And over time, that becomes a massive problem because antibiotics become useless. At the bottom here, we can see a really simple example that on a light colored surface, we have two different types of bugs. We have green and a lighter white, uh, yellowy color. The birds are attracted to the green bugs because they're easier to spot, easier to eat. Eventually, all of these bugs get eaten and we have a greater number of these lighter colored bugs in the future populations. Again, we can see a couple of more examples. Uh, so natural selection in nature, there's a variation amongst the population of rabbits from a really fast rabbits through to really slow rabbits. They pass that trait onto their individuals. However, we have a population of foxes that enters the environment and only the blue rabbits that have that faster speed are able to survive because they can obviously escape their predators much quicker much quicker so that brings us to looking at divergent evolution so divergent evolution is sometimes also referred to as adaptive radiation so it's the evolution of one species into a number of different species so organisms with a common ancestor diverge so spread apart and evolve into different looking organisms, okay, or different looking structures. So for example, the pentadactyl limb in birds is used for flight, while in whales, it is used for swimming. Humans, it's used for grabbing, picking things up, etc. And this can lead to completely new species. So for example, we have our original organism here, and then what we end up happening have happening is based on changes in the environment we have two new organisms that evolve that have similar structures so they may have similar structures however each of those structures has now developed a completely different use which leads to completely new species so the most famous example of divergent evolution is that which is described by darwin on his voyage on the beagle so when he visited the Galapagos Islands, he found that each island had a different species of finch. So these were these little birds that he saw. And he believed that finches from one species arrived on that island from the mainland of South America, which was quite close by. And that because the islands were separated, the populations ended up being unable to interbreed. So they became adapted to their individual little habitat that was there. So some places only had plants that produced buds and fruits. On other islands, the food source was mostly insects. So the finches adapted to be able to deal with the different changes on each of the islands that he visited. So convergent on the other hand, so convergent evolution is where organisms evolve similar structures and morphology. So that's the way that their body is put together in response to similar environments, even though they are not closely related, okay? So different species become similar, even though they have had different evolutionary pathways. So the, the um, here we start off with organism one and organism two living in different environments to start off with. But over time, those different environments become very similar and it results in two new organisms. So there's no real similarity between our, no similarity, sorry, between our original organisms, but the two new organisms that have adapted and changed over time 
look almost the same as each other because they are living in the same or very similar environments. So we've got some examples here where over time a fish has evolved into a shark, a land reptile has evolved into an ichthyosaur, and a land mammal has evolved into a porpoise. So we can see that at the beginning, all of these organisms were very different. So we've got a fish, a reptile, and mammal. So uh, three completely different animal groups, which have three very different sets of characteristics, have all produced organisms that, as we can see from the pictures, have very similar structures, shape, size, color, and um, behavioral characteristics. But there's no way that these three organisms could interbreed with one another because they are, as we said, completely different animal groups. And we'll be having a little bit more of a look at this in class and having a look at a couple more examples of how um, species have evolved based on their environment to look very similar, even though they're completely different. And that brings us to the end of this video. Thank you for watching.